Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. This week at Safeway, shop the 10 for $10 produce sale. With the 10 for $10 produce sale, get items like large avocados, mangoes, green, red, orange, or yellow bell peppers, cucumbers, large lemons, or 16-ounce bags of Signature Farms baby-peeled carrots for the member price of just a dollar each. Plus, select meats like Signature Farms 80% lean ground beef and Signature Select extra meaty pork loin back ribs are buy one, get one free this week. Hurry in before these deals are gone. Visit Safeway.com for more deals. It's cliche time, but what a difference a week can make in football. Welcome back to The Nest after a derby win. For a derby win, of course. 11 in a row for the mighty West Coast Eagles, convincing over the Fremantle Dockers in the second half through Jones, and that was a whole lot more enjoyable. Absolutely, Garby. Uh, a bit more of a pep in our step heading into the podcast this week. Um, I don't want to overplay it too much, but I think in modern derby history, it's one of the most important victories that we've got. Um, I felt the the identity of the way that we played had been lost as a result of the loss against Geelong, and we needed to get that back. It was really important not just to get a win, but also to re-establish who we are as a football club. And I think we did that uh, on the field on Sunday. Considering the injuries, there was a lot of character and just the way we played was um, a, a lot more like it. So, yeah, great to get the win. Second half was fantastic. It was a lot of fun to watch. So we'll go through the game. We'll look at the back line, these injuries, which look like they're going to linger for a few more weeks. What it means moving forward for the team. We've got your nest votes as well. It was really hard picking five wasn't it? I mean, I left three or four out who I really wanted to give a vote to. I'm sure it was the same for all of you, Liz, all of you listening and for you, Drewy. Um, But so we've got the votes ready to go. So we'll update the Nest medal with Glee and then look ahead to the Hawks. Before we get on to another subject, which is an interesting one, and that is the team photo, which has caused just a little bit of a hoopla over there in the West and around the country. Um, you couldn't go to the game in the end, Drewy, because of the lockout. So we know that you were looking forward to it so much, your first trip to Optus. Just talk us through how it all transpired for you over the weekend. Yeah, it was a bit of a dramatic week. Um, as far as derby build-ups go, um, you couldn't attend any events or get into the spirit of, of the actual game, but there, there was a lot happening. Um, so obviously that lockdown... That happened the weekend before that delayed initially getting over to Perth. Eventually, uh, I went on Wednesday. I was able to get to West Coast Footy Club and have a look around um, the Mineral Resources Park. And I went to Shattenhurst press conference, went out to the Dockers HQ as well. Um, and then, yeah, the Derby was done via the Derby presser was done via Zoom. So we weren't able to get out and, and say good day to the coaches. Uh, and then, yeah, obviously the cases that transpired on Saturday afternoon, initially they didn't change anything with the Derby on Saturday, but then Sunday morning, as we know, um, they shut out all the fans. So that was a bit of a blow, unfortunate. To be honest, once the wheels started turning on Saturday afternoon, I, I wasn't surprised that they made that decision, mm. given that Mark McGowan has been conservative um, and had a heavy hand with these COVID restrictions in the past. But, um, yeah, I mean, best laid plans uh, these days aren't always a guarantee, are they, Garby? So, yeah, we'll get over there again and hopefully back to Optus to see a win. But the most important thing was, A, for me to see the family and then, B, that the Eagles got the win and both those things happened. Fantastic. Yeah, shame for everyone listening as well that you couldn't go to the game. And a bummer for the club. I mean, they've lost up to $2 million. And, yes, we are probably the richest club in the league, but it still hits the bottom line because you – you set your budgets with these things in mind, like you bank a full house for the Derby. And so you say, all right, this is what we can afford to to lay out as a result. And now that hasn't happened. So the club's obviously got to rejig things a little bit. So that's a shame. I'd imagine there would be some sort of compensation from the AFL. You would hope so. But I uh, haven't heard any confirmation on that yet. And it could be worse. We could be the Dockers, who not only lost a lot, but then had to have to move to Brisbane this week and play the Lions away at a time when they're trying to get their season back on track. It could mean as well that the Eagles have to move their game against the Crows, which is our home game next week to Adelaide as well. Hopefully things quieten down by then. But 
you know, it's tough on the Dockers after what they've gone through and, and, and the loss on the weekend. So we're a little bit fortunate, Drewy, in that regard. Well, it all depends how you look at it, doesn't it? So um, they obviously lost their Len Hall game against North Melbourne, which is a really big match for them the week before. Mm. Um, obviously, it was an away derby for them. Uh, but then now having to go away, they get to swap that game at least uh, with the Brisbane Lions at the Gabba. So they'll get to play that home game later on yeah. in the year. Um, but the prospect of having to spend a couple of weeks away from home um, is never enticing um, when you've got you know family and friends that you want and loved ones you want to spend time with. Um, yeah, and it, look, it's a hit for, as you mentioned, Garby, just for West Coast because we didn't get the home derby last season either. So we haven't had income from a Western Derby now since 2019. Um, so that's not ideal. I know that Trevor Nisbet did speak to the AFL about whether they could postpone the game and make it up later. Um, but the AFL, I think, probably squashed that pretty quickly um, given the fact that they were able to play and that was the, probably the most important thing. Um, so it goes ahead um, and the Eagles lose out a little bit of money. But as you mentioned, everyone's making sacrifices, including Freeman will have to be away from home for a couple of weeks. I've been pretty keen on the Eagles getting a private plane. Um, it's been put on hold now, that, that little plan. Probably just my plan, to be honest. But to me, it seems a no-brainer that the Eagles and Dockers share a private plane to make travel into state a whole lot easier. Obviously, yeah. a lot more difficult to do now. So, yeah, it, it does hit us a little bit. But, you know, we're lucky. We'll be okay in the long run. But it's uh, a shame in that regard. But as you say, the most important thing was the four points and the Western Derby trophy. Uh, but that trophy was at the centre of a little bit of a controversy over the last couple of days with the team photo. And Alex Witherden, Jack Redden and Jermaine Jones doing the circle game in the middle of the photo, which unbeknownst to me and the majority of people, I'm sure, and certainly the players, is apparently some sort of signal for white supremacist groups nowadays. So obviously the players had absolutely no idea of that. I mean, an Aboriginal player was involved in Jermaine Jones, so they had clearly no idea about it. Um, and yet some people have wanted to you know, anger up about it and point the finger at the Eagles and, and say that, you know, why are you doing this signal when it's so offensive to so many people? I mean, some of the reaction was utterly ridiculous, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, clearly this got out of hand and, uh, you know, outrage is you know, or goes hand in hand with, with Twitter and social media. So obviously it was a, a personal joke between a few of the players Um should they really have been doing it? Like West Coast have got a little bit of form in this. Um, it just popped into my head recently that you remember the Harry High Pants stuff yeah. with Tom Barras in a previous derby photo. So maybe it's a it's this on running inside joke for West Coast players to sort of play pranks in team photos, but yeah. um, it seems a little immature. I'll be honest. Look, the, the reaction to it because of the white supremacist link is just so stupid. I mean, I was arguing with people on. Twitter yesterday, people who wouldn't even have an idea, I think, who the West Coast Eagles are, who were arcing up about it. And I'm like, hang on, you're telling me that an Aboriginal player purposely made a white supremacist signal in a team photo? Like, just have a think about how ludicrous that is. And then it was defended by an Aboriginal player a few hours later when Tim Kelly faced the media. But there were some of these loonies on Twitter who wanted to have a crack, who probably don't have, have a clue about the Eagles, but just thought, here's a chance to arc up about something. I mean, it just shows how ridiculous some people are nowadays. But I agree, Drewy. I, I think it is a little bit juvenile, which is one of the comments that came out of the club. Like, Jack Redden's 30 years old. I remember playing the circle game in primary school, and I'll be honest, I didn't really find it funny then either. I just thought it was a pretty stupid <laughs> game. Well, why are they doing it? I mean, it's just yeah. – that, that, that's the part that was surprising to me. And I saw it, and straight away I went, oh, the circle game. That's a bit silly. Like, it's not that funny, to be honest. The other question I'll pose to you, and this might be a little bit extreme, and you can maybe apply the fun police tag to this, is it a bit disrespectful to the Western Derby trophy? Uh, yeah, I think so. I just th I think it's all well and good to to have a have a joke and a muck around in the change rooms after the game at training anytime really. Um, but in that moment where you're getting your photo taken with the Western Derby trophy, you're representing the club and you're supposed to be you know celebrating the fact that you've got you know a really important victory. And you know that that's going to be plastered over, you know, the front page of the West. Uh, it's going to go on the club website. It's, you know, that could go on membership cards. 
Uh, it's, uh, that's an important moment in time. You know, that's another derby victory for the West Coast Eagles. It's actually not really about you yeah. individually. It's, it's about the club, what it represents, fans. So that kind of ruins the photo a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, for me, it, for me, it's disrespecting the trophy, but also the game and the achievement. So, yeah, I'm all for the boys having a bit of fun. I like to joke around and, and be a larrikin just like every other you know, everyone else does, just just not in that moment. Pick, you know, pick a better time. Yeah, I think it's a bit silly. I mean, the, the high pants thing, the one-off a few years ago, we all had a laugh at that. It was fine. But it doesn't need to be a continuing effort by the players to pull some stunt in every photo. And it is an that's important for, That's for social media. That's, yeah. that's for your Instagram story, you know, that sort of stuff. That's for your personal social pipes. Yeah. That's not an official team photo. So I hope someone at the club just pulls them into line and then it say, says, you know, enough's enough of that stuff. Respect the photo, respect the moment and um, and leave it out from here on in. And I don't think there's too much more that needs to be said about that. Right, let's get on to the game. It was a, a corker of a second half. I mean, it was a 50-50 game going in. I think we all thought that. Frio's midfield, our midfield undermanned. They were in good form. We weren't. Um, we were missing a number of key players, of course, our three most important backs, arguably, Hearn, Barras, McGovern, maybe Shep's in line with, with Hearn in that one, um, Liam Ryan as well, and they were pretty much full strength, apart from Luke Ryan, who was a, a big absentee for them too. And yet we blitzed them in the second half. It was great to see us respond in a big moment after we've questioned them all season, you know, when the, when the Chips are down and you're being pressured. You've gone to water a bit, yet they rose. They rose in the midfield and they responded on a big stage and, and got the job done convincingly and then were pretty ruthless as well and put the foot on the throat and made it a, a big victory. So everything was impressive in that regard. Yeah, uh, from the halfway through the second quarter all the way through to the end of the third, you know, we were the dominant team. It was eight goals to six in Fremantle's favour and by, you know, by the end of the third quarter, three goals to 11 during that period. Um, so really impressive. And Garby, I often think that as, you know, just as a football philosophy in general, um, if you're a good enough team, generally you'll kick a winning score. Um, personnel isn't always as important, I think, in that respect. But when you're lo- missing midfielders and key backmen, that makes things a bit harder because you, the impetus – can be taken away from you by the opposition. So we, we were those two areas that is where we were under strength. So for us to break even and, in fact, you know, dominate the midfield and for our defenders to stand up, only concede, you know, two goals in the second half, that's a really great effort. Um, you know, it reminds me a little bit of the St Kilda victory last season where we were severely undermanned. Um, but probably, the, I guess, the more impressive thing about this game was that not only did we get it on our terms, we then you know, put the pedal to the metal and put Frio away. And, yeah, I, I think just to, to sort of put a, a full, stop, full stop on this Garby, Fremantle, just go back to the shallow end, boys. <laughs> go, back to, go back to the kiddie menu. You know, you're playing against the big boys here. And unfortunately, even though you had everything in your favour, no home crowd, there could have been 55,000 screaming West Coast fans, no McGovern, no Barras, no Shuey, no Yo, no Liam Ryan. You still couldn't get it done. Not even close. So go back to the kiddie pool, splash around in the shallows for a bit longer, and we'll see you next time when you're ready to play with the big boys. I had a mate message me, a Frio fan, who said, you just live in our heads. Like, we've got them mentally. I mean, do you think that's fair? Have we, have we just between the ears when it comes to the crunch, this current group of dockers? And they are young. And I think, honestly, the difference in the game for me was just our experience and our bigger bodies took over. And they're a talented team, but they're pretty raw, especially in the midfield, apart from Fife and in Monday, You know, the rest of them are still young players, albeit very good ones. But I think we've just got a mental edge over them as well. And we turned it up when it came to pressure time and, and they couldn't go with us. So that's a factor in derbies that we need to try and expose over and over again. 11 win a row suggests there's a big mental barrier there. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. There's a mental barrier, Garby, and you could see the frustration coming through with some of the Fremantle players later in the game, particularly Nat Fife. I think Jack Redden was was getting into some verbals with their skipper, and and he wasn't enjoying that. Um, and you know that by that stage, it was clear the game was over. Um, but 
I just thought I thought going into the game on paper, Fremantle were never going to have a better chance to knock us off. Everything seemed to be going in their favour. You know, even losing Barras and Hearn so close to the game, throwing out you know what would have been hopefully a, a slightly rekindled back six. So yeah, we did a lot right, Garby, and you know you could tell the difference from the Geelong performance straight away. You know, in the first five seconds, Nick Knapp laid that big tackle on Sean Darcy. Uh, then from that all up, Jack Redden made a smother, you know, to stop there being a clear clearance from Fremantle. So even in those very early stages, you know, there were moments where the pressure was high, the tackling was good. Um, and even though Fremantle had started quite well, they, they kicked the first couple of goals, we were still doing all the right things. It was only a matter of time until it clicked. Um, you know, Nick Nat sacrificed his body to give off a little handball to Brad Shepherd, which ultimately led to Jermaine Jones kicking the first goal. You know, there were lots of little moments and indicators early that we were we were on, um, and there was some physicality that was really impressive. So, you know, the one obviously that stands out is Josh Kennedy. Oh, you know, yeah. His Chapman had already dislocated his shoulder, and had bra- you know he was bravely battling through that, but when he turned. And that ball was sort of, you know, bobbling and he hadn't quite taken control of it yet. You could just see Kennedy coming and you almost braced for that contact and he let him have it. You know, he went right through him and that's what he had to do. Beautifully executed bump. But it was just good to see that physicality um, and that real pressure around the ball and that moment probably, you know, encapsulated it for us. Well, that guy, that moment got us going. Like the third quarter, we rip it apart. I reckon Kennedy gets the energy through the team with that bump. It was a big moment in the game. Watching it back, I watched the third quarter back and I'm like, yeah, that's been underplayed, just how big that bump was. The commentators are going on about Chapman being brave, and he was, especially considering his shoulder was already bung. But that got the Eagles going. It was like, no, nah, no, nah, come on. It's time to flex our muscles here and let's let the big boys just, you know, bully them around a little bit. And that was like, yeah, all right, come on, boys, go with him here. And uh, and they did. So, yeah, big moment in the match and great to see JK lead like, lead like that. G5 got really narky late, not just with Redden. The the stud scrape on Jackson Nelson late when he pushed him in the head and then scraped him, like we really got under his skin. That was pretty dirty, I thought, from from that five. So, yeah, the midfield battle was well and truly won between the ears and uh, when it came to winning the footy. Kelly, magnificent. The only downside is... Why did he say that post game about having the freedom? I know it won't make a big difference in the big scheme of things because opposition coaches do their due diligence and they know that Kelly's been tagged all season. And I'm sure Hawthorne will try tag him this week. And I don't know why Frio didn't properly. Um, but I just wish he hadn't said that to draw any more attention to himself, which he has done. When Yo and Shuey are back, go for your life. Tag Tim Kelly all you want because. We've got the weapons in there to hurt you and you can sacrifice a man if you want to. But at the moment, it makes it a bit tougher for us when TK's tagged. He was unbelievable. What a big game for him. 42 possessions without a mark. That's amazing to show how, how hard he worked to get ball. Yeah, in fact, I think that's the most possessions that anyone's ever had without taking a mark. So, I mean, why weren't we kicking it to him? <laughs> he would have had 50. But um, 23 contested possessions, Garby, that was the bit that, really impressed me. So we talked about Kelly last week and we said, oh, you know, we love his out, what he brings, his outside class. But it was the grunt work that was really important for us on the weekend and he got that done. You know, that was what he, that was what he wasn't able to do against Shalom the week before. So not only was he freed up by not having a tag on the outside, but he, he won ball in the clinches as well. So, yeah, excellent performance. He laid nine tackles as well. So he did the tough stuff. Um, and got plenty of the footy which we needed. Um, I don't know about you, but I thought Jack Darling was really, really good again. Yeah. Um, you know, especially early when the game was on the line, I thought his first half was was excellent. Um, when we needed to, to, you know, to stay with the Dockers because it was quite an open and free flowing first half. Lots of goals kicked. I think the most ever in the first half of a derby with about twenty goals kicked. Um, so he was important for us early. Um, and it was so good to have Josh Kennedy back, you know, the two of them working together. Um, Andrew Gaff got a hell of a lot of the ball, 35 disposals, felt like a bit more 
of what we're used to seeing from Gaff. Oh, his best um, game of the season, undoubtedly. I mean, there was yeah. a bit of zip back. He won it well. He won it in tight. He used it well. Like, just far and away his best game of the season. It was relieving. That's the word, you know, that resonates. Relieving that he played like that again. It's taken six weeks, but all right, Gaffy's pretty much back. Yep. And then, you know, Redden was was bubbly and bright. I don't know why. He can't seem to do it away from home, but, you know, he was he was busy yesterday, and that's probably the best word to describe him. Sorry, on Sunday, and, you know, he was he performed really well. Good to see him bounce back. Dom Sheed, is, you know, he got 30 disposals, worked really hard, you know, both inside and out. Um, liked what I saw from him. You know, he was the obviously that, down and had, a, that, had the virus a bit before. The thing that Sheed's doing really well at the moment, Drewy, is he's having those bursts in games when he breaks them open. He did it against the Pies and he did it in the third quarter. So his overall game is nothing special, but then he has seven possessions in like 10 minutes start of the third term and really effective possessions and goal-scoring opportunities are created through him. That, that's what I'm liking about him at the moment in certain games. He's actually just having huge impacts in bursts and at crucial times. Yeah, no, and he he is a burst player, isn't he? Like he yeah. he can take hold of games, and um, yeah, I mean we all lifted in the third quarter, but but Sheed was a massive part of that. Um, and when he's up and going, you know, that, that generally coincides with us playing good footy. Um, special mention for. A couple here, Garby. Jermaine Jones, I thought that was, you know, comfortably his best game for the club. He looked good further up the ground, um, kicked a couple of goals, but his work around the ball I thought was really impressive. Uh, Josh Rotham, again, he keeps standing up when required, particularly given our issues down back. I thought he was excellent on Sunday. And what do you think of Oscar Allen down back? A, a couple of times, of, you know, he was flying over packs mm-hmm. with a big iron fist. Um, certainly wasn't disgraced at all when he was one on one down back. Um, I think Oscar's shown he can pretty much play any position. He was great. You know, I thought he was really, really good. I mean, it, he played there in juniors, so he, he knows the position well enough. They've signaled that this is something that's going to happen. He'll move back at times. They used him as a swing man, but Adam Simpson said he was playing forward until Shannon Hearn went down, and then they had no choice but to move him back. And I thought he was really good. Harry Edwards is class. Like, he's just a classy performer. He's really composed, good in the air. He's just so cool under pressure. We saw it in that quarter and a half he played against Geelong before he got concussed on his debut. And we've seen it now in, in the derby, the derby, sorry. It's just, he's, he's really cool under pressure. And that's something that's impressive about him. Arise, though, before we get into the back line in detail and what happens, arrive, arise, Sir Jared Brander. I mean, he's arrived. Now, as a West Coast Eagle, that was just a wonderful second half from him. Like, floating back, moving forward, bursting through the midfield, kicking goals at, at a big time in the game. He was fantastic. Like, just really exciting. And he continues with this trajectory. Good luck matching up on him. I don't know how you do. What player do you put on Jared Brander when he's floating back and giving you a chop out defensively, moving forward and kicking goals, but also a threat in the air? I mean, this is the kind of player that we punted on with pick 13, not punted on, but, you know, went ahead of many expectations with the pick because he can be so unique and there aren't many players in the competition like him. Yeah, when you saw him floating back defensively, I mean, he had that little moment early where he dropped that mark, um, but he responded really well to that. Um, And, yeah, he, he looks a really intriguing player and... You know, the, you ask who would match up on him, it's almost Yo. Like, Yo would be the guy that would have to stop him because his height can be dangerous going forward. It's obviously, a you know, a real asset for the team if he's floating back and rolling back as that wingman. But then his skills were good, yet, you know, on the weekend, kicked a couple of goals. Like, he, every time he got the ball, they were effectual possessions. You know, like it was a 16-disposal game, but... You know, you noticed all of them. Um, and, yeah, I'm just enjoying him, you know, being in the team and watching him develop. I didn't think that he looked equipped for that wing role when I'd seen him play it, in, you know, last season. But, yeah, he's developing really nicely. And uh, I can safely say that I underestimated him and I'm really enjoying being wrong. He 
There was a moment, though, early in the game that needs to be pointed out. I think he did. I'll be as brash as I can be. I think he shat himself in a marking contest and he dropped it. And it was a crucial time in the game early on. He, he The contact was going to come and he just dropped his shoulders a little bit, I think, bracing for it. That's the moment that I hope is pointed out to him and they've just got to go, look, you, you just got to be tougher there. you got to be stronger there. Your all-round game was fantastic. But, you know, in a big match away from home, so on and so forth, yeah, those are moments that can really hurt the team. Thankfully, it didn't on this occasion. But yeah, that was the only negative of his day. But that happened early and he responded so well. So... That was great to see. He was fantastic. So on the back line, right, considering Allen played so well and Edwards played so well and Rotham, who we haven't spoken about, early on especially, I mean, he stood out more than anyone else. Shep had a great game too, but, you know, he I thought he rose above the rest, Josh Rotham, and, and that was great to see in the absence of the players that we know are out. Let's say they were all coming back this week. McGovern, Barras, Hearn, what do you do? Oh, uh, well, yeah. Well, Edwards goes out. Um, it's, it's, it's rough on him, isn't it? Like he did nothing it's rough, wrong. It, yeah, it's rough on him, but that's where he's at. He's he's a, currently a backup defender for us, and the fact that he's young means that it's acceptable for him to continue to develop. You know, in the twos, um, pretty handy guy to come in as your your next up yeah. tall defender. He's shown he's good enough. He's composed. Yeah, he, do, he doesn't. He's Tabernar had a couple of moments in the first half where he got hold of us, but yeah, Harry Edwards was able to to sort of rein him back in. Um, so yeah, he looks impressive, but he's a he's our backup defender. So yeah, he goes out. I know it's tough on him, but that's what would happen. And then Oscar goes back forward again. Yeah, yeah maybe Jake Waterman goes out of the team. See, that's the other that's the out. other aspect to this that's interesting. Waterman had a really good game. So I, I don't think Waterman's in the team if McGovern and Barras are playing. But now he does keep his spot on form. Like he was he really contributed enormously. So, yeah, Allen goes forward. Maybe Waterman goes further up the ground. It's a selection dilemma when they all three of them come back. Edward's out, all right, I'll give you that one. I don't know what else you do. It's tough, man. I think one of the players that has been in the team for over 12 months or so I think has to make way. Yeah, there's a there's an argument there that if you want to keep Witherden's like sort of his weapon in the team mm. and have a, a really good kicking rebounding defender, then it would have to be a Cole or a Nelson that would make way. And then you just move maybe Duggan further up the ground and have Witherden in and with Hearn, you know, Shepherd, etc. Um, because he can't like, – Rotham's not going out of the team now. No, no. Rotham, Rotham's a walk-up start. So, but he's he can play tall and, and small, and that's the advantage you've got with having Rotham in the team. So, mm. And, yeah, the, 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 the juggling act of Oscar Allen, Jake Waterman, Brander, Kennedy, Darling, Vardy, Nick Natanui all be in the same team. Like, you would think one has to give. Yeah. But so – yeah. Brand is playing so well that it makes it more complicated because Waterman was probably in our best 18 going into the season. Yeah, it's it's man, it's really tough. So I'm saying if Gov Barras Hearn come back this week, Edwards goes out, yep. Yeah. Langdon probably goes out and you push someone further up. And I think it has to be Nelson. Like it would be so cruel in him and he plays a lockdown role. But I'm saying to Tom Cole, we need you to play that lockdown role that Nelson's been playing. And maybe he's just a slightly better all-round player. Could be. It just could be horses for courses. Like yeah. if there's a if there's a role for Nelson to play on a bigger body, half forward flanker or or wingman or you know whatever role you want to use Nelson in, then he might may stay in the team if he needs someone a little bit more robust. So that's it's a good position to be in. Yeah, but that's we can. Sure. You know, if we've got 25 or 26 players who are able to, you know, come in and do a job, think about the fact we've still got to squeeze, squeeze Yo and Shuey back in as well. So and Liam Ryan. Yeah, and Ryan. So there's, you know, that that makes me feel pretty optimistic about where the team's heading. If you take out that one Geelong performance, um, you know, and you think about the amount of guys that have to come back, it, it means we're, we're not in the worst spot. <laughs> We've got a very good list. We have an exceptional list. 
And when they all come back, you know, okay, they're not all going to be fit at the same time. That just doesn't happen. But, you know, half these guys come back and we've got a really good team. And some of the guys who, you know, perhaps didn't think they'd be playing as much have had some more experience and that will bode well for the second half of the season. So, yeah, we've got some mental issues. We know that. Some toughness issues on the road. We know that. But personnel-wise, we're looking pretty strong when everyone comes back. So we'll get into the challenge of the Hawks in a moment. Let's do our votes from the Derby win, the 5 4 3 2 1. So I'll run through mine firstly, Drew, quickly. Tim Kelly, five. That was obvious. I went Jack Darling, four. Thought he led the forward line superbly and uh, and really ran the show for us yet again. I went Dom Shee, three, just for the influence he had in the third quarter when the game was up for grabs. Thought he really excelled. Uh, Josh Rotham, two, amid the defensive absentees, I thought he shone. Uh, and especially early when the game was tight, he was really good down back. And I went Jared Brander, one. Again, third quarter, stood up enormously. Really tough on Andrew Gaff, uh, who I thought deserved a vote. Uh, tough on Jermaine Jones, who could have had a vote. Tough on Jamie Cripps, who I thought was really good all game and hasn't yep. got enough credit, I think, from Eagles fans. I think... I don't know, some people are a bit negative about Cripper. I think he's had a pretty good year and I thought he had a really good game. I tried to squeeze him in, just couldn't. I think Brander's all-round game defensively and then when the, the match was there to be won, he stood up enormously. Got him the one vote from me. Yeah, hard to disagree. I mean, I think having tallied all the votes from the listeners, and it's the most we've ever had, um, about 12 different players got votes. So, you know, the the love was well and truly shared around, uh, which is, you know, a real positive. So I went five Kelly as well. Only one person didn't give Kelly the five. They gave it to Sheed. Uh, Darling four. Uh, I just thought early on he was fantastic when the game was on the line and the whips were cracking. Yep. Jermaine Jones loved his game. I gave him three votes. Okay. Um, really like what he brings. Two to Andrew Gaff, you know, back to somewhere near his best. And I gave one to Dom Sheed. But you know, throw a blanket over about six or seven yeah. that pro- probably could have got the three, two, one. Um, I thought Josh Kennedy was massive for us, captain on the day. Yeah. Did some really good physical things early, as we've already mentioned, um, and kicked accurately on goal early. Um, you know, Josh Rotham, I thought was awesome down back. Jamie Cripps, we haven't mentioned yet until you did just a moment ago. He played the game with sore ribs, and he was laying tackles. He was doing the hard things, running around chasing, harassing, and kicks a couple of goals as well. It's a hard position to play when you've got yeah. sore ribs as a pressure forward. So that's a really mighty effort. I'm sure behind closed doors there'd be a lot of people giving him pats on the back um, for, for producing that performance when we really needed it. So, yeah, a lot of a lot of love for a lot of players. If, can you uh, update us, Garby, if I give you the, the 5 four, three, two, one from the listeners? So 109 votes for Kelly. Yep. We get the five. Darling gets 44 votes and gets the four. Yep. Jermaine Jones and Andrew Gaff both got 38. Mm. Gaff gets the three because he had more four vote games. Yep. And then, so Jones gets two, and then Doc Shea was next, and he gets one vote. That means in an updated Nest Medal tally, Tim Kelly moves to 12. Jack Darling moves to 12. Andrew Gaff only goes to six. Jermaine Jones gets his first votes for the season. He goes to two. And she goes to six. So we all of a sudden have a log jam up there. Leading on 13 are Oscar Allen and Tom Barras still. Jack Darling and Tim Kelly just one vote behind, both of them on 12. We have Nick Natanui on eight. And then Dom Sheed separates from the pack to go to six. So that is our top six in the Nest medal. Oscar Allen and Barras on 13, Darling and Kelly on 12, Natanui on eight, and Dom Sheed jumps up on six. Jermaine Jones gets his first votes for the season. Sorry, Andrew Gaff's on six as well. So Sheed and Gaff both on six. So they are tied, yeah. and uh, and Jermaine Jones gets his first votes for the season, which is great. So it's tied up, tied up at the top now. Yeah, and um, good to see Oscar Allen, Barras, Kelly, and Darling all up high, all key players, key pillars for us at either end. Yeah, and we won't have Tom Barras against the Hawks yet again. Same with 
Jeremy McGovern, same with Shannon Hearn. So it's a big test now as we look into the weekend, Drew. A big test away from home without some key players. We'll go in warm favourites. We're coming off a big win. But, I mean, the microscope of the AFL world is going to be us on Sunday at 110 at the MCG to see how we go on the road. And you know what? That is well and truly fair. For me, it's not so much about playing away from home. It's about how we deal with the pressure moments like we did on the weekend ever so well, um, but without the comforts of, of Optus, of course. So, yeah, big, big test. Uh, one I think we can revel in, but, geez, it's, it's not going to be as easy as, um, you know, perhaps we think away from home without those players. No, and they never they never are. And ultimately, as I've already said, we've, we've shown that we haven't lost our identity as a football club. You know, we were able to, to get the pressure back, get our hardness back around the ball um, and play the way that we know that we should and can. But now it's about going on the road and getting a win. So that was that Fremantle game was a stepping stone towards starting to then prove ourselves as a legit contender by winning, you know, not just in the comforts of Optus Stadium. So Hawthorne comparatively provide us an opportunity to get a softer kill on the road but they are coming off a really horrible performance against St Kilda. So you expect there'll be some sort of bounce back and some sort of response. Now, they'll give us a tougher game than St Kilda got on the weekend. But I think if we're really honest with ourselves, Hawthorne do not have the cattle to trouble us, Mm. even with the injuries we're going through. But we don't get any – there's no respite this week. Like, no one's coming back from injury. We, We still have to deal with the exact same absentees. But if you look at the performance we put on on the weekend, you know, even if we play, you know, half as well as that, we'll probably beat Hawthorne because they're struggling. Um, so it's an important game for us. It's probably going to be wet and cold at the MCG. Mother's Day, um, yeah, let's get one under our belts and, and get some separation and, you know, get to five and three and get a win at the G. That'd be nice. So what are the worries for us? Amira and Wingard probably coming back. Burgoyne's a question mark, but Amira and Wingard seem likely. So that's a big boost for them. And and that makes the midfield battle, you know, tougher for us. And they're going to have Mitchell, Warple, Amira. Wingard might float through there, Liam Shields. And we know that we've got some personal issues there yet again. So it's a big test for Kelly, who'll probably cop a heavy tag. And then Gaff needs to perform again. And Redden needs to perform again. And Sheed needs to perform again. And they need to do it for four quarters. Because if we just even up in there, we should win the game. Like, yes, we're missing players down back. But you're confident that Edwards and Allen and Rotham and Shepard can handle the Hawks forward line, which is not that dangerous. I mean, they're going to have Kajitsky down there, one of... Jekka and Mitch Lewis, who, you know, on paper we should be able to handle. Yeah, Luke Bruce is a danger. If Gunston goes forward, that's a big player to watch. But, you know, that's a real weakness for them right now, so we should be okay. And then we know our forward line is dominant and we can hurt them in that regard. So those guys in the middle have just got to match it against what is a very good on paper, a Hawks midfield brigade. So that's going to be the test. They can't let us down in there like they did against Geelong and like they did in the second half against St Kilda. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you know they'll be they'll be stung um, by being run rampant over by St Kilda, and then you you know you get the injection of of O'Meara into that midfield. Wingard's you know on his day can be a really dangerous player. We know all that. Um, I just think we've got a bit too much for them when you look at the key pillars down back, but they haven't got a strong back line. That you know it's Hardigan and Frost who are going to be up against you know Darling and Kennedy. Um, you know, we'd think we'd, we'd have the advantage there. It's a shame that Oscar will probably have to play down back, that we couldn't have, you know, the third key pillar down there to really stretch them. Uh, but, if you know, throw Vardy up there, who was a bit better against Fremantle last weekend, you know, hopefully we can stretch them and take advantage of that area where they're missing, you know, some, some key personnel. Um, but, yeah, across the board, we look stronger. It's just a matter of, you know, getting the job done and and probably we need to limit his influence who can get a lot of the footy. I think Jager in their win against Adelaide was really impressive. So, yeah, they've, they've shown little signs here and there. You know, CJ for them down back has been really good. Um, but across the board, they don't have the weapons to trouble us. No, I wonder if someone plays a forward tag on Giath. He's been close to their best player this season. He's really dangerous off half-back. So I would just wonder if... 
you know, Zach Langdon maybe plays a bit of a forward tagging role in him. And I notice his numbers are down a little bit the last couple of weeks, GF. So maybe opposition teams are starting to put some work into him, which he deserves. He's been that good. So that could be a challenge for someone that'll be interesting. But we should win. But yeah, for me, it's all about the midfield. Just even it up there and we'll be okay. The MCG, like that's exciting watching us play there again. And we have confidence at the G because Optus and the dimensions are the same. That's not something they really have to worry about. You know, a number of players from 2018, great memories, of course, but the dimensions of the ground, it's just going to be pretty seamless for them in that regard. So that's another, I think, box that's ticked for us going into the weekend. All right, shouldn't be something we have to worry about too much. Yeah, we haven't played at the MCG for a while, so it would be nice to get back there and get into the home comforts. Um, yeah, getting wins in Melbourne and getting away from home and getting into the routine of winning week in, week out. It's pretty important if we're going to go far. Like, I don't think it's a stretch to say that probably top four was off the agenda if we had have lost the Derby. So you know, we need to keep banking these wins through this period where we have got a more favourable draw. Like in the next five weeks, the only game that I feel that we sh- are a chance of genuinely losing is probably away against GWS. We've got Essendon at home, Adelaide at home, and we should beat the Hawks. So there's winnable games coming up. Most certainly. And look, teams at the top are dropping games. I know that the Dogs in Melbourne are going pretty well at the moment, but... You know, Geelong's dropping games. Port dropped another big game on the weekend. There's a bit of a question mark on them on the road. Uh, Richmond's dropped games despite a really good performance by them on the weekend. So, you know, it's not exactly as if there's a top four that's separated from the rest and we're just playing for a position to jostle in. I mean, we've got some issues. We've identified them at length. But, you know, the, the draw opens up for us nicely. We beat the Hawks. You've got Adelaide and Essendon coming up and we can be around the top four. We've got to take advantage of this one on the weekend and... We've just got to prove to ourselves that on the road, we can do it. This is the game now. And there'll be pressure all week in the West. And so there should be. And we'll get ripped apart if we lose this game because it won't be good enough. It's a massive one. And we just need to take advantage of it. And hopefully we can because uh, that would just be such a good feeling heading into a game against the Crows at home, which obviously we should uh, we should be expected to win. Absolutely, Garvey. Look after the mothers. Get a win on Mother's Day and uh, go to five and three and start to separate ourselves from the pack a little bit, um, and you're right, there's been some inconsistencies and some bad performances from most teams in the comp, except for probably Melbourne and the Western Bulldogs. Um, so, you know, we've got, you know, an easier run coming up so that we can put ourselves in a really good position um, come the latter half of the year. But, so. uh, and, then, and then Liam Ryan yeah. back in three, four weeks, they reckon maximum yo back around the bye, you know, it starts to get pretty promising for us. So that, that's exciting. We just got to get through to that period. Yeah, absolutely. Garby, it's been much better this week. <laughs> no, no doom and gloom. Celebratory. We're back. Eleven derbies in a row. At this rate, we'll win twenty-five in a row. We're in their heads. It's fantastic. Thanks everyone for listening. Thanks for all your feedback, for your votes. Let us know your thoughts on the pod for this week. I uh, really appreciate all the support and uh, calm the Eagles. Let's get it done at the G on Sunday. At Safeway, shop the 10 for $10 produce sale. With the 10 for $10 produce sale, get items like large avocados, mangoes, green, red, orange, or yellow bell peppers, cucumbers, large lemons, or 16-ounce bags of Signature Farms baby-peeled carrots for the member price of just a dollar each. Plus, select meats like Signature Farms 80% lean ground beef and Signature Select extra meaty pork loin back ribs are buy one, get one free this week. Hurry in before these deals are gone. Visit Safeway.com for more deals. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.